Good afternoon. Uh, I am Marcy McGuire um, from the West Orange uh, Office of Reproductive Medicine Associates of New Jersey. Um, welcome to RMA and Jay's Facebook channel. Um, very happy to be chatting with you guys today. Um, so today we're going to address some frequently asked questions, but before I do that, there is a legal disclaimer that I have to read. So I will get that out of the way quickly. Um, so the disclaimer is this information provided on this Facebook Live video, rmanj.com, and any other Reproductive Medicine Associates of New Jersey RMANJ owned material is provided as an informa information resource only. It is not to be used for any diagnostic or treatment purpose. Um, the information provided does not create any patient-physician relationship and should not be used as a substitute for professional diagnosis and treatment. Um, please consult your own doctor. Um, RMA and J expressly disclaims responsibility and shall have no liability for any damages, loss, injury, or liability whatsoever suffered as a result of your reliance on the information provided today. Okay, so that's out of the way. Um, so today we thought it might be helpful to discuss some frequently asked questions that um, a lot of patients with infertility um, come to our offices to inquire about. Um, the first one is very simple. What is fertility or infertility and who does it affect? Um, infertility is actually relatively common. 15% of the population. Um, Infertility technically is defined as having unprotected intercourse for a year without having a pregnancy or a child. Um, nonetheless, uh, if patients have disorders wherein they're um, not ovulating regularly or um, a history of chemotherapy or something of that sort, they could certainly come in earlier and would be potentially diagnosed with infertility in that case too. Um, so that gets to the second frequently asked question, when should I make an appointment? Um, generally in couples wherein the female is less than age 35, um, you can try for a full year um, having unprotected intercourse prior to seeking professional evaluation of your infertility. Um, in women who are over age 35, because age plays such a big factor in fertility and in the chance of conception, it makes sense to come in for an evaluation after trying for only six months. Um, and then of course, there are other situations that can come up. Um, as we were saying before, a woman who may not be getting her period on a monthly basis, somebody with a history of endometriosis, somebody with a history of a pelvic infection or multiple surgeries, maybe they had chemotherapy in the past. Any reason that you think your infertility uh, may have been in your fertility may have been impaired, it is all right to come in um, and get checked out. Um, okay, um, and then the third uh, question was, um, is fertility preservation right for me? Who, who might ever consider a fertility preservation type of um, intervention? There's really two instances where in that could be um, useful. Um, in the first situation, a woman who's not yet ready for pregnancy, but wants to preserve that option, that opportunity, may elect to freeze her eggs um, you know, at a young age so that, that she could use them later when she is in a better uh, or more prepared for pregnancy. And that can be because she just hasn't found the right partner yet, or maybe she's on a certain career track and wants to accomplish um, certain career goals before attempting pregnancy or become more financially stable, whatever the reason is, um, a woman could go ahead and freeze her eggs in that instance um, um, and then sort of reserve the right to have a child later in life. Um, interestingly, there are a couple um, companies that are endorsing this as a treatment. Um, Facebook is one of them and Amazon and they are um, you know, sort of promoting uh, coverage for that kind of treatment and that kind of option for their employees. Um, the other type of patient or, or person who might be interested in fertil fertility preservation would be somebody facing a dire diagnosis such as cancer or another disorder that would require um, medical intervention which could interfere with their fertility. Um, this is typically cancer requiring chemotherapy which can be very damaging to eggs but um, there are some other situations too. Um, but if anybody ever has questions on, you know, would, you know, is it right to think about freezing eggs? Is it the right thing for me now? Of course, you can come in um, and we'd be happy to talk to you. Um, 
now actually might be a great time just to point out if anybody has any questions um, we are on Facebook live now if you have uh, questions you can type them in um, to your keyboard and we will um, answer them as they come in um, so another question that comes up quite frequently is uh, what is polycystic ovary syndrome is there a treatment for PCOS um, PCOS is also relatively common and affecting 5 to 10% of women of reproductive age. It is defined as a triad of irregular periods, um, evidence of high androgen levels, and a certain what's called polycystic appearance to the ovaries. Um, there are disorders and diseases other than PCOS that cause irregular periods, so it is important to have a full workup before kind of claiming this diagnosis. Um, some of the other things that can cause irregular periods include decreased ovarian reserve, low egg count, um, or issues related to appropriate signaling from the brain to the ovaries. Um, so it, it is important to get a full workup for that. Um, evidence of high androgens may be something you can see physically. So if a woman has um, hair growth on her chin or her chest, or um, acne, sort of oily skin, that's a physical sign that you can see of high androgen levels. Um, you can also, there can also be patients with PCOS who, who bear no physical signs of high androgen levels, but in their blood they have elevated testosterone levels or free testosterone levels, and that um, can also be used to facilitate this diagnosis. Um, the third criteria of polycystic ovaries is a tricky one to make. Um, Again, not everyone with a lot of follicles has polycystic ovarian syndrome, and it's important not to kind of um, put everyone into this category unless they truly fit this diagnosis. So um, PCOS is common and actually quite treatable uh, in terms of fertility, although not curable. Um, women with polycystic ovarian syndrome um, are at risk for some other disorders that are important to pay attention to, including um, diabetes, um, metabolic syndrome like high cholesterol and obesity, that kind of thing, um, and also endometrial cancer. So those are some things to look out for. Um, women with PCOS sort of have, um, in, their, in their reproductive or fertile years, tend to have two main goals. You know, A, I would like to have a pregnancy, and B, I'd like to regulate my periods. Um, so those can't necessarily be addressed at the same time. Um, but there are treatments for both. Um, the, uh, in terms of tr fertility treatments for polycystic ovarian sy syndrome, things as simple as Clomid can be used, um, or Electrozole, which is another pill that enhances ovulation, um, or things as um, involving a greater deal of intervention, such as in vitro fertilization, are also highly effective. Um, so if anybody thinks they might have polycystic ovarian syndrome or they've been told that by their general gynecologist and they um, haven't yet been successful at having a pregnancy, um, definitely you can come in. Um, there are many options available to you uh, in that case. Um, okay, uh, so now switching tacks a little bit here, um, the next frequently asked question is what is comprehensive chromosome screening? Um, some other clinics have called this PGS, or pre-implantation genetic screening. Um, comprehensive chromosome screening is a technique wherein the placental cells of an embryo can be tested to see if that embryo is genetically normal before it's transferred back into the woman's uterus. Um, and this has been a great boon to um, fertility clinics worldwide. Um, in the past, um, Problems related to genetics contributed a great deal to infertility, and in, particularly, in particular, infertility associated with age. Um, so as, a, as women become older, an increasing percentage of their eggs uh, obtain genetic or become affected by genetic issues, um, incorrect chromosome numbers. Um, and this leads to a higher risk of miscarriage, a higher risk of infertility, a higher risk of having a child affected by a genetic disorder such as Down syndrome, trisomy 13, trisomy 16, these types of things. Um, so with the advent of this technology the, and the ability to screen embryos for genetic disorders prior to um, transferring them into a woman's uterus and helping her to become pregnant, 
we've been able to improve fertility, improve pregnancy rates, decrease miscarriage rates, um, and improve the chance of a healthy life birth. Um, this technology is not used exclusively in, in um, women of more advanced reproductive age. It's also helpful in younger women too. Um, even in women less than 35, about one in five embryos is genetically abnormal. So there's still a significant chance that an abnormal one could be transferred. Um, so even in women who are in their early 30s, um, it's a useful technology um, to, to make use of. Um, okay, so then what is single embryo transfer? Um, that is something that it has resulted from a couple of different advancements in technology recently. Um, single embryo transfer is exactly like what it sounds. It's putting one, only one embryo back into a woman's uterus. Um, this is extremely helpful because um, uh, twins and triplets uh, are associated, or twin and triplet pregnancies are associated with a greatly increased risk of obstetric complications like preterm delivery, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, um, C-section. Um, so essentially, by transferring more than one embryo into a woman's uterus, you could take what would have been healthy embryos, healthy children, and, turn, and sort of turn the tide to have unhealthy children because they were just born too early or had other complications in pregnancy. So avoiding um, twins or high order multiple gestations is a, is a big deal. It's something that is a big goal for fertility clinics and I think is a helpful thing to patients. So, um, but how do, you, how do you reduce the risk of twins? How do, you, um, how do you reduce the risk of those complications? You have to transfer just one embryo and that means you have to have really high quality embryos that um, produce pregnancies with great efficiency. Um, that has been a, um, achieved through something called blastocyst culture. Um, so embryos grown to the blastocyst stage, essentially day five, six, seven, are um, the most robust, the most capable of leading to a baby. So um, certainly you want to grow them to that stage. Um, also paying a, a great deal of attention to synchrony between endometrial, uterine development, and embryo transfer improves pregnancy rates. Um, and then of course using the chromosome screening we just discussed to make sure that you're transferring a euploid, genetically normal, um, appropriately, appropriate number of chromosomes, embryo into the woman's uterus to facilitate a healthy pregnancy. Um, so that single embryo transfers. Um, and the next um, frequently asked question also correlates with that. It's, uh, the question is, what is frozen embryo transfer? Um, so during an in vitro fertilization cycle, often multiple embryos are generated. Um, that, is, that is good and desirable and, and um, will improve the chance of success. Um, but A, you don't necessarily always want to put all of those embryos back in at once for the reasons we just talked about. Um, and B, that we sometimes need extra time to do the genetic testing and other things. So we just can't um, immediately put embryos back into a woman's uterus. Um, so in a frozen embryo transfer cycle, embryos that have been previously generated through um, in vitro fertilization are thawed um, individually, so one at a time, and then put back into the woman's uterus. Um, there are some important differences between frozen embryo transfers and fresh um, transfers or transfers during the stimulation phase of an IVF cycle. Um, during IVF, a woman will take um, uh, some hormones that increase her estrogen levels quite a bit, um, and that sort of affects her um, reproductive milieu, the, the uterine milieu. Um, high levels of estrogen can affect placentation, the, the formation of the placenta and how it um, functions. Um, so transferring an embryo during a fresh cycle or the cycle during which the woman took hormones can lead to a suboptimal placental function later in the pregnancy. Um, and it's actually associated with lower pregnancy rates too. However, if a woman undergoes an IVF cycle and all of the embryos are frozen, so that the woman's hormone levels are high, but she's given time to kind of recover and recuperate, the hormone levels come back to normal, the embryos 
eggs are grown but frozen, cryopreserved, um, then um, in a subsequent month, the uterus can be prepared and then a single embryo can be transferred into an environment that's much more receptive. The hormone levels are more natural and the chance of um, pregnancy is higher. The chance of placental issues is lower. Um, so that, uh, that could be a very helpful thing. Um, um, so uh, by and large, the fertility community is moving towards frozen embryo transfers as a preferred technique um, in order to obtain higher pregnancy rates and um, lower uh, obstetric complications. Um, okay, and then the final question here is what is in vitro fertilization? Um, um, so that is a technique wherein a sperm and an egg are united outside of the body uh, to create an embryo. And the embryo is grown in the culture in a laboratory for about five or six days um, until it gets to the blastocyst stage, which is about a 300 cell embryo. And that is what is ultimately transferred back into a woman's uterus. Um, so a lot of women have asked, you know, if I do IVF and I retrieve multiple eggs, am I taking away from my overall fertility? Am I somehow using eggs that I would have had later in my life? Um, and that's probably not the case. Um, so women are born with about 2 million eggs and we relentlessly month after month lose co a cohort of them, maybe 10 or 15 eggs each month. Um, in a typical cycle, one of those eggs would be ovulated and the remaining, you know, nine or so would be discarded, undergo atresia. Um, in an in vitro fertilization cycle, a little bit extra of a, the hormones that a woman's brain naturally makes are given to her so that the other nine or so embryos from, or excuse me, eggs from that cohort would grow as well. So instead of um, using just one out of the 10 eggs that a woman would have that month, all 10 eggs are allowed to become mature. Um, and then they are retrieved from her body with a relatively simple surgery called an egg retrieval. Um, that surgery lasts maybe 10, 15 minutes long. It's done under sedation. So the woman is asleep, but not intubated. She's breathing on her own. Um, and we use an ultrasound guided needle to take the eggs out of the follicles and the ovaries. Um, and again, 10 or 12 eggs is average um, for what a woman would have each month. Um, now the sort of woman's job for the, that in vitro fertilization cycle is over and the job of the laboratory begins. Um, so at that stage, again, the sperm and the egg are united and the embryos grown in culture for um, about five or six days to make a blastocyst, which is a 300 cell embryo. Um, uh, uh, and at that stage, typically the blastocyst is frozen, cryopreserved, um, tested for the, by CCS testing for genetics. Um, and in a subsequent month, the embryo is transferred back. Um, and I see uh, we have a question here. Um, how long after having a healthy IVF baby should you wait to have another baby? That is a great question. Um, uh, ideally, you would wait at least six months. We know there are an increased risk of obstetric complications if, a pregnancy, if pregnancies happen within six months of each other. Um, ideally, a, a patient would wait at least a year. And this is true for IVF uh, babies or pregnancies, but it's also true for naturally conceived pregnancies. Uh, pregnancy is, a, is um, an important and uh, difficult event. Um, it takes a lot of energy and nutrients to support another life and to grow another life. Um, and the body needs some time to heal and also to build up their nutrient stores and your energy stores in between pregnancies so that you're as prepared for baby number two as you are for baby number one. So, awesome. Cool. Um, so it looks like that's the questions for today. Um, it was so great to talk to you all. Um, thank you for joining our Facebook Live channel, um, and I hope to see you in West Orange. Have a great Friday.